A sail or place of ants, and I can attest to the fact that they have really, really big ants there that bite, and it really hurts when they bite you. Um, but here's the Great Palace, kind of reminiscent a little bit of what we saw at Edzna and so forth. Um, but we don't think this was actually a pyramid. It appears to be more of kind of like an administrative palace. Uh, here's the Chalk deity again. And I threw this in here because, again, Yucatan doesn't have a surface water so the Maya had to come up with ways to collect it and one of the ways they did was they would use underground cenotes which are kind of like openings in the big limestone and they would collect water so they would often build or construct a little platform around the top of the cenote that was slanted in to collect rainwater. Also at Sayil, and I didn't get the picture put in here, um, we have in some si inside of some of the buildings, red handprints. And some people believe that's a symbolic reference to the god of the gods, Itzamna, um, whose name can translate into the divine or celestial hand. So it's really kind of an interesting site. I, this was my first archaeological experience was at this particular site. Then we have Kaba also in the the Puk region. What's interesting here is we do see some of those Toltec styles. So again, similar to some of the things that we see at Chichen Itza also. Um, these are kind of bad pictures that I took, I apologize. But you can see the warriors up here. This is a really famous building in this area called the Codes Pope. And it's just all like little chalk faces going across. Again, rain god, if you're in an area where there's no above water ground or above water sources, somehow getting water is going to be really important. And then the famous arch at Labna, which also has some red handprints inside of it. Uh, there's Labna, just showing you some pictures here. Here's that sock bay we looked at before, El Mirador, or the lookout. Many sites had this. And the famous arch that was drawn by Frederick Catherwood. Of course, the site that most people know about, and the one they think of when they hear the the word Maya, or at least ancient Maya, is Chichen Itza. And this is in Yucatan. If you're ever in Cancun, you can take a quick trip out here. Uh, the Castillo is the most famous pyramid, I think, of the Maya. This particular one, on the spring and fall equinox, the corner cast shadows of the plume serpents along the North Stair, which is what everybody's out here to see. So some pretty interesting architectural features going on here. We see the Chakmul, again, something that we also saw at Tula. We see another type of observatory here. And then again, we saw this earlier too with that same type of architecture that we saw at Tula, so Temple of the Warriors. Um, the temp El Castillo is actually a temple for Kulkukan, known in some of the other societies we've talked about as Quetzalcoatl, or the feathered serpent. Now we do have ceramics at Chichen Itza, Chichen Itza that do connect it with the sites in the Puk region. So, largest site on the peninsula, and that's actually acclaimed by the Maya themselves, and not just archaeologists. The Itza managed to consolidate their power for a while, but around 750 BP, we see a lot of internal conflict occur, which leads to the decline of the Itza's power. And many of them actually flee and end up back in Guatemala at a site we're going to talk about in a couple minutes. The power seems to move over then to a site called Mayapan, and the Kokam lineage comes into power. Uh, we see defensive structures here. There's a stone wall. And we don't see a lot of stone walls around Mayan sites. Uh, we also see it at another Yucatec site called Tulum, another one you can see if you go to Cancun. I highly recommend it. It's a beautiful site. Um, it fell around 509 BP, appears to be a period of extended drought, followed by famine, uh, which caused a revolt by some of the Xia lords. No power arose to replace the Kokam lineage, and we see hundreds of small polities that are connected by the rulers or the Batabs. Um, the, ba the polities then are aligned either through having related Batabs in charge or through st strategic political alliances. Warfare, very common during this time frame. 
Occasionally, a strong Batab would unite several polities, but we see nothing on the lines of Chichen Itza or Mayapan um, before the arrival of the Spanish. Now, some people have referred to this northern lowland Mayan peoples as a watered-down version of the classic Maya. So we see some of those classic elements, but we never see quite the fluorescence that we see during the late classic period. So at the time of the Spanish arrival, again, we still have quite a few Maya living in these small polities. Uh, the first of the conquistadors to arrive was Cordoba, and he arrived in 433 BP or AD 1517. Um, he could not defeat the Spanish, was that, or excuse me, the Mayan was run out. And it's not until 1528 that De Montejo returns and successfully defeats many of the Yucatec Maya. But the last Mayan stronghold is in the Paten region of Guatemala, in Lake Paten Itza. There were nobles from Chichen Itza who had fled to the area, and they built a smaller city on the island, which is where the town of Flores is now, in Guatemala. It helped to isolate them and protect them, but eventually they did fall in 1697. Of course, that's a very brief, brief, brief overview of the ancient Maya. I could have gone into a whole lot more detail, but I was trying to keep this on the short side. And if you have any questions, uh, just email them to me or catch me in class.